All right, so I'm going to get started with this one. Okay, so this is Fergus's, and he said that he's going to be doing a repaint of it. I'm not sure, I don't understand um, exactly where you're going with it, um, like how you're going to correct it. But I do have some ideas on how to repaint it if you do plan on repainting. Um, something really cool in these kinds of battles is the Tilted Horizon. Tilted Horizon is an illusion given that the person who is viewing the image, so the viewfinder, is on an actual person who is about to fall or is encased in the action or is um, very, like, you know, has a tilted pose that is falling off. And so it's the illusion that the, bat, that, that the, that the horizon line is tilted when it's just the camera or the viewpoint or the perspective um, that is tilting it. Um, so is the voice okay for everybody? Is everyone else having an issue as well? <clears throat> do I do I sound really um that's closed maybe I should close Skype uh, it's fine everyone everyone else is okay I'm sorry if it's cutting out for you I'm not really sure why it would be um sounding like Marvin Gaye what do you mean sounding like Marvin Gaye <laughs> My voice sounds low. <clears throat> I'm sorry, sorry, YouTubers. You have to just wait through technical difficulties. It is live, so there's going to be problems. Mm. You mean great? Okay. <laughs> All right. Good news. So, what's something that you can implement, um, Bedhead Omega? <laughs> or Fergus, is the tilted horizon. Um, but you don't just tilt the horizon because that, like this and then you keep both characters standing just like this or else it'll look like a tilted stage or a hill that they're both on. We tilt the horizon when we are experiencing some kind of foreshortening or some interesting foreground versus background action. So this is, I pulled this random image from, it's a really good drawing from uh, from Google, and um, I just wanted to show you how you can make it look more interesting. So in this case, the tilted horizon can be implemented, and it seems like there's someone behind this individual who has the camera on, who isn't holding the camera steady, so it isn't on some sort of crane or some sort of stable um, uh, platform, it's actually just handheld, and that's why that tilt happens. Um, the tilt also happens when you are trying to showcase a large expanse of, of environment. Um, and the large expanse of environment could again be seen from the perspective of a ship or some or some you know hovercraft or something that is also tilting so your position on the ship with the camera holding it makes it seem like the horizon is tilting of course the earth isn't going to tilt and you're going to stay, stay still of course it's you tilting and the earth is staying still it's just your perspective so this is an interesting way for you to reorganize the composition of your painting um, uh, just like this, so you can have one character in the foreground, whichever character is holding the threat or is about to pose the threat, so you can have this character here in defense be the boy. <clears throat> he seems like he's in defense mode, and this person is in attack mode, so we get to see the axe, and we get to see the blood, and we get to see the splatter, and we get to create a nice, beautiful little um, uh, spiral of the, you know, the golden ratio happening where we are drawing attention from his hand to his weapon, to this character, to his weapon, and back towards this character here. So we have a nice little train of, of, of movement. This is a very standard um, pose for battles. Um, it's um, a spiral of doom. <laughs> um, welcome, Olvar. I'm not sure if I welcomed you. Um, so yeah, it's, the, it's a very, very standard pose between two characters fighting. They use it in movies, they use it in paintings, they use it and everything and I recommend you use something like this please 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 ladies and gentlemen watching on YouTube watching here never stage battles or never stage interactions between the two characters whether it's in a comic strip whether it's in um, so a comic strip is another one of them uh, whether it's a um, movie whether it whatever never stage them in a full body long shot um, like this because it's very very it's, it's when it's done it's done on purpose for a very very good reason and it's not done to be uh, compositionally pleasing or cinematically pleasing um, it is or aesthetically pleasing it's done for a very serious reason probably sizing up both characters and relativity to each other if you've got one big monster of a character and you've got one tiny guy and he's looking up and he's all tough and he's ready to kick ass that's pretty much the only time you have long shots like this 
Um, if you do have them all the time, it looks like a stage. It looks like some audience is going to be just sitting here and everyone's watching the, the Macbeth play. Um, it's not really Macbeth, more like Hamlet. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, that's pretty much what I, that's all I have to say about it compositionally. Um, and, uh, and I think that's it. I don't know. If you do want to go for this kind of screen, um, this this kind of screen organization, you're going to have to widen up the canvas. The canvas is going to have to widen up for one big reason, and that's um, the camera that you see used in movies is usually a widescreen. It's usually a wider uh, view, viewpoint or perspective. We're just thinking about like you know two eyes beside each other. Again, back to the camera, back to who's holding the camera, and how much we want to see in the periphery vision. The sky pretty much isn't really important at this point, unless there's like a dragon coming up, and then the horizon would go a little bit lower if there was like a dragon coming up or something, or POI in the distance, point of interest in the distance in the sky. Um, that's pretty much the only time you would want to make the whole screen point towards the sky, so then both characters would be standing like this, and then a dragon comes out of nowhere, like, I don't know, like Skyrim or something, and then attacks people. Um, but if it's just these two characters, nothing interesting is happening in the sky, you're going to want to cut off the top of the sky and leave it something like this, and then fill in the rest on either side. Um, that'll really give you, if you don't feel like changing it to this complex scene, I recommend you do, but if you don't want to, this is another option. And then finally, um, you need to start creating some level of distance in between um, the units. So there are different ways to, to make it seem like a character is in the distance. So there's the fact that you shrink their size. That's one. If you guys want to write this down, there's, there's size, so there's scale. <clears throat> then there is stacking. So one object in front of the other. So this, these are all things that make it seem like a character is, or some object is moving into the distance is how you create depth in a 2D field to create the illusion of 3D. Um, then there is the scale, I mean not the scale, the spectrum, so objects in the distance will have a fade, so atmospheric fade. You cannot read my writing, just pretend like you can. Objects in the foreground are darker, objects in the foreground are also bigger, compared to objects in the distance. They stack over everything, so if it was a layer on Photoshop, it would be the topmost layer, because it'll just st um, uh, stack over everything, and um, or layer over everything. And then finally, there is the detail fade. So objects in the foreground, objects in the midground, wherever the POI is, which has to be either midground or foreground. The POI can't really be in the distance. The distance is subject to blurring, subject to atmospheric fade, subject to size shrinking, subject to, uh, to detail fade. Um, so an object that is supposed to be the focal point should not be placed in the background if it's supposed to be a focal point. It really shouldn't. Uh, it should be secondary or tertiary of importance. Um, if it's a really important character, it should be placed somewhere in the midground or the background or the foreground because that's the place where we will get the most um, uh, out of it. That's the place where you can really exhibit the character in detail um, in all its glory. All right, so fade atmospheric can be also blur, and then detail can also be blur. And then the, the detail blur, meaning that objects in the foreground, not the immediate foreground, which is like can also be blurry, but objects like such as him or him, which are also foreground to, to midground, um, need to be detailed, which you have here. So, <clears throat> in saying all of that, let's try to bring in some of those rules. So there is this individual here who needs to be... Are you kidding me, Photoshop? Are you fucking serious? Um, yes. No. Okay, fine. I have to restart Photoshop. It's okay. All's well. I'll bring in the other stuff. Because the pen pressure didn't work. It's my tablet. I'm really sorry. I, uh, there's a major problem with my tablet. Okay, so this character here needs to be blurred, but he's also in the distance. So if this character is this size, Fergus, if you're watching, um, is this size and he is n not on the same ground level. So if you want to know if a character is on the same ground level as the other, just draw a line under them. So this dude's foot 
hits this ground level. This dude's foot hits this ground level, and this dude's foot hits it. So this guy's closest, this guy's second, this guy's third, this guy's fourth. This guy's the smallest, and yet he's almost the same size as the guy that's third last. So if this guy was on this guy's level, he'd be this big. Because if he's this big in this distance, then he's probably going to be way bigger when he zooms up. So what you want to do is fix that. Unless he is supposed to be Goliath, if, and if he is Goliath, why isn't he the one but fighting in here? What's what's the point of these? Doesn't matter. Um, you're just gonna have to shrink this guy down. So we're applying the scale. So we're applying the size rule. Not just that. I'm gonna just push him in the distance even further. so that any atmospheric fade does apply to him, it applies proportionately. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to try to detail things in the same way. Okay, so now this object is in distance and is more faded than the object. So you see the depth that suddenly happened than the object in the second, third most distance. So this object would be more faded. Let me turn off these reds. Okay. Then we've got that fog, and then we've got this guy who is also a little bit faded. No, that's too much. So now we're applying the atmospheric fade, so the blur. And so this guy here is subject to some blurring, very gentle, not too much, don't overdo it. And let me just add in some basic... <clears throat> landscape detail here, because I kind of lost it. Excuse me about my coughs. Okay. All right, and then we are going to bring in some individual light on these these characters to counteract that. So this character here needs to have sorry that's my cat um needs to have some of the light of the area so whenever we highlight a character in an environment the character has to be lit up with the color of the light in the area so the, the intensity of the color as well as the color I mean the intensity of the light source as well as the color of the light source so the color of the light source is a very gray the color there isn't much contrast happening because it's not a lot of sunlight so you're gonna have to throw in o over everything that is facing the light, all the faces of the 3D objects facing the light have to get some of that color on them. So again what this does is just like atmospheric fade it makes it seem like the objects are in the same room experiencing the same level of atmosphere, the same the same light source, the same environment, the same air, they share the same air. So air, you can't really paint air but the way to paint air is to paint the objects in the air, and with those objects you reveal the presence of the air. So I'm just painting his little armor. They get brighter the closer they get to the light source, and more faded the further you go. And so this, what this does automatically is it gives in more detail. So now we're doing the um, environment depth. We're creating environment and creating depth by detail, so detail fade. So it isn't just about fading the detail, it's about creating a spectrum where well, the most detail is in the foreground or the more POIs, foreground or midground. And then objects in the distance are the opposite of that. So again, just drop tooling the sky. I'm literally drop tooling the sky color and bringing it in over any objects here that need some highlights. There aren't any, some, any immediate cast shadows either because um, there is no one direction the light source is coming from. There's gray clouds everywhere. There isn't. There aren't any serious shadows. There aren't any purple shadows. Any yellow lit up highlights. It's all very, very bleak. Very Scotland. <laughs> okay, 
And so some basic stuff. The shield is going to be just a little bit light, so I mean luminous, luminous, reflective. So I'm going to bring in a little bit of that. And I'm just going to try to create some level of shine on the shield, just a little bit, just to show that it's different kind of material. And as you can see, what's happening is things are starting to communicate a little bit better light-wise. I do recommend reorganizing the composition. Now, there's only so much changing the light source and fixing up the depth can do. You really are going to have to just reorganize the, the entire image. Then we've got the sword, which is a really nice change of, 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 um, of material or textures because it's a reflective material. Let's see. So what it's going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in the color of the air one more time, which is the color of the clouds. And I'm just going to use that to illuminate <coughs> the sword. Create a bit of reflection to it. And this character here does not look like he's looking at his um, enemy. All right. So I did that, and it's not just about creating the glare on the sword in one area, it's about continuing that glare to bleed outside of the, of the sword. So what's going to happen is we're going to have to smudge or mess around with the edge of that sword just a touch. Because that's sort of how the highlight works. <clears throat> I'm just going to um, sharpen that. So this POI is going to be, it, it's too symmetrical, that's the thing. Symmetrical uh, compositions are extremely boring. So if I have highlight on this guy, it's going to be heavy in this side. So in order to complement this side as well, I have to have a highlight on this, this guy's axe as well. So I'm just going to do that. Sorry if I'm not looking at the chat. I do want to get through the critiques. I'm just trying to find the high point of the axe, the point that faces the light directly. It's probably somewhere. Bless you! Someone sneezed. Um, it's probably going to be somewhere at the top of the sword. Right up here. It's okay because it's on a new layer, so it's okay if I made it messy. I'm just going to blur it, and then I'm going to erase what I don't need. Okay, so doing just that. <coughs> welcome, Draken. I didn't see you earlier. Did I? Did I welcome you? I'm extremely forgetful. Okay, so this level of highlight is complementing the other side. So again, please consider reorganizing your canvas. It looks a little bit something like this, where you have the spiral, the golden ratio happening, a nice, beautiful movement of the eyes around the, 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 the most important units. Um, try to get something like that going. I know it seems a bit daunting, you're going to have to repaint it, but I swear to God, you're just going to learn. You're just going to keep learning, and it's just going to be another learning opportunity for you. Uh, so go for that. Duplicate the layer, merge that down. I'm just going to sharpen. Okay, and then we're going to have the glare. Okay, so because the sky is so high up, um, we're going to have to close it off. It cannot be this bright, that high. Uh, you're going to have to close it off just like this. You're going to have to make it a little bit darker. And you cannot have the background back there to be that light. You're going to have to bring in the spotlight just around this, these two characters. So again, it's like treating it like a stage. So where we would get the highlight is in the middle, mid ground again, thinking about POIs in, in the foreground. So just like this, bringing in the highlight in here. Um, 
Let me see, how am I going to do this? I'm going to bring in the color of the sky, put it on soft light. And then erase away. Okay, and then duplicate. All right, and then I'm just going to erase to make it seem like it's leveled with the horizon line. Don't just throw in any textures without leveling them. Make sure you level them with the horizon line. Damn you, soft light. Whenever you merge soft light layers, they just go... They lower in opacity. It's really stupid annoying. Okay. Smudge. Just messing around. So now we brought in the light toward the mid-ground, where before it was a little bit darker, now we brought it in. And what that's going to do is... What that is going to do for us, it's going to make it a lot easier for the eyes to, to, to deviate toward, not really deviate, but get directed toward the, 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 the main characters, which are here and here. Alright, and then you're going to have to decide where the light source is in the sky. Where is it? Where is the brightest point in the sky? Basically, where is the sun creeping behind the, the clouds? And once you decide where that is, you're going to have to bring in some glares. Um, not lens flare or anything, just points of the light and the, and the water where the, where, the, where, the, um, where the sun is peeking through. So I'm going to make all the water one level. So I'm going to just choose the color of the sky. Literally, again, just drop tooling the color of the sky. As you can see, that's the best way to unify a landscape is to just bring in that color of the sky. And, um, and use it to unify your image, the color of the air, the color of the atmosphere. All of that is one big system that helps unify your, your image together. Both in color and in, and in color palette and in physics and in the sciences of it all. So actually this might be cool having that rock reflect on the water puddles. So probably recently rained if this is in England or the UK or anything recently rained. So I'm just going to throw in a little reflection. Just like that. And then I'm going to decide, okay, I want the light to be again, because it's such a symmetrical image, I guess I'll make the sun somewhere in the distance up here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the dodge, make the sun in the sky somewhere up there. So now it's somewhere a little bit higher than where it was before. And wherever there is a little bit of water or whatever, that's where it's going to reflect, somewhere in the middle. So now we've created like a, a rift between these two characters, a symbolic rift, it's an actual cut. So it is a bit messy, I'm sorry about my soft brush, and I'm going to darken the water that is not in that area. should not be using a soft brush for this. You should be using a textured brush, please. The only reason why I am is because I have to save time. Okay, so I'm just bringing the, the reflective the points of reflection on the puddles and from one area. So going down only in this route because that's where the sun is. Okay, that's going to create a nice break in the symmetry. I mean, a nice cut in the symmetry. If this is supposed to be a flag, you can really mess around with it and um, have another flag on the side um, doing its thing. That way you can keep playing with the symmetry composition. But it's not that popular anymore. It used to be popular, you know, with the, with the holy compositions when they drew prophets and battles and old masters when they used to do stuff like that. Symmetry was sort of a testament to their perfection or whatever. Placing in the water reflection and halfway will reinforce the symmetry. Okay, and then finally, I'm sorry about the crude way I've drawn it. 
finally I'm just going to get a fog brush and I'm just going to bring in the actual fog. So you've created all the effects of the fog. It's made objects in the distance fogged out, but there is no presence of the fog observable in the canvas and that's a bad sign. So you're going to have to get something that, that represents them. Again, I'm just going to drop tool the color of the background and I'm going to bring in that fog to hover just below the character's feet. And that's going to reinforce the atmosphere one last time. So you see, this is all, let me just cut off the canvas, this is all me painting the atmosphere. It's no longer me painting the characters individually, it's painting the atmosphere. So the characters are part of the atmosphere and the atmosphere, they're subject to the changes the atmosphere will cause on them. But, um, but, but the atmosphere still needs to be considered a singular force. And so now you can literally have the, the title or whatever the game title might be. This, this is kind of a composition that's really powerful for, um, I don't know, Clash of Clans. <laughs> Let me make it bigger. It's really crappy. I'm sorry. I used the gayest font. Um, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I used the lamest font. I should not have used that word. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean it in like a homophobic way. I just mean it in the dumbest, stupid, gamer, dumb shit way. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Draken. Be my friend. Okay. So this is sort of the typical, um, if you've ever seen the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the splashes, or the cover designs for the Age of Empires CDs are always very, very symmetrical, just like this. Um, so, <laughs> the font, the, the, um, the, what's it called, the Times New Roman font, that was crappy. So yeah, so I'll do a before and after now. I did talk about the composition, so I did tell you, so don't say I didn't uh, recommend a change of the composition, but this is me crit crit critiquing it and just keeping it the same composition you chose because of course I cannot repaint it for you and show you. So I applied all of the depth rules that I talked to you about blurring off characters in the distance. I've staged it so you see what happens when you darken the background and darken the top corner and bring in the fog. Do you see that depth? It's like BAM! Comic Sans. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so, Bedhead, are you with me? Fergus? Where are you, Fergus? <laughs> Did Fergus leave? Fergs? Oh, no, there he is. Okay. So, Fergus, you're, you're with us? All right, so you see the depth? Try bringing that in. All right. So flatten, Let's see, oh, oh poops, oh that's not good, that's not good, that is, <laughs> that's a British accent, uh, Fergs, can you send it to me one more time, are you on my Skype, you're still on my Skype, send it to me one more time. So I need to do a proper before and after. Dang it all. I think I still have it on my... Oh, no, I have it on my Facebook. No, 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 I have it on my Facebook. Don't worry, I'm not on Skype. I, I, I left Skype. I've excommunicated it from my RAM. <coughs> Just getting a drink of water one second. Okay. <clears throat> Fergus William Russell. <laughs> oh, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that was the gayest laugh. I'm sorry. Oh, crap. That was the lamest laugh. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. Today I fucked up. I fucked up bad. Oh, no. Dang. Damn it, what am I doing? Okay, so closing that and then bringing that in. 
and then opening that, and then control C, and then drop. Okay, so this is the before. This is after. Before, after. You see how the light on the, the glare on the sword and the, um, the framing of the canvas, the water reflecting the sunlight, that I didn't do very well. Okay, and then um, the the glare on the on the axe. All of these accessories that create depth have have created a better staging. However, still the image lacks in in, in, in composition. You know, real intriguing composition, dynamic composition. So um, think about that that one image. If you want me to send it to you, I can send it to you on Skype as well. I mean on uh, Facebook called max res default um, I'm not sure who drew it but that's just what I wanted you to have and then you can still have the the atmosphere you can still have the fog you can still have the water you can still have it all it's just that now the camera is from a different angle it's taking a cool photo um, instead of something like a stage like an on-screen stage I mean a stage in a theater <laughs> save file <laughs> Yes, that's what I always do. I'm too, t I'm, I'm too way too lazy to choose a title. Okay, so we have this piece, and then we've got this piece. Uh, this piece right here, I found some references for it. This was Jacob's. I'm not sure if Jacob is here today, but what I have here is an example of how the horizon line stays preserved when you have flat objects sitting on a, a surface, sitting on a ground surface. So if you can just take a look. You'll see that um, you see how the straight lines, how they how they're preserved, and the straight lines get closer together. The further in the distance you go, so the straight lines get a lot closer together, but more distant. The closer to the canvas that you get. So this is one rock's width. This is one rock's width, and these two rocks are probably the same size. So this is a compression, which is another unit of depth. So that's something else to add to the list. There's stacking, there's detail fade, there's atmospheric fade, there's scale, there's value change, light to dark, and then there is the compression of surface areas that are flat. So if this was the horizon line, this is the horizon line. Um, actually, the real horizon line is back there, but the actual surface they're on, the secondary or sub-horizon, um, is over here. And then we've got the thinnest lines in the distance and then the exact opposite in the foreground. So when you have a horizon line and you have any units on it, what will happen is that exact thing, that exact little phenomenon. You will have a compression of the horizon line and a compression of these units. So what I'm going to do is I'm literally trying to... No, no, no. I'm literally trying to create that compression. I'm trying to think about where the horizon line is. So in this case, the best way to fix it is to get yourself hooked up with some vanishing points. So over here, there's a bit of a, of a stacking and a compression. Just like I just showed you, I'm literally just compressing it. Because I'm trying to express how these lines get closer together the further you move. And the further from each other, the closer you get to the camera. Is everybody with me with all of that, or is this just too complicated? Am I not explaining it well? Everybody with me? By the way, welcome everyone, um, I, those who I haven't welcomed. Let me see who you are. Um, nim, 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 Highlander, um, Sea Breezy, Canavaro, uh, Abu, um, Draken, hello. <laughs> I don't know who else. I haven't. I know Multigrain. Uh, storyteller, welcome Tasmani. The welcome everyone. So everyone with me on the on the compression thing. So it's not just about this kind of compression. It's also about the texture. 
So this happens with units that are, you know, you're designing, it happens with actual textures, it happens, it happens with everything, anything that you lay on a horizon line that is subject to a, a, a vanishing point, that is subject to a distant horizon line, that is subject to compression, will have this little thing happen to it. All right, it will have this little doohickey happen to it, where you get thinner lines versus thicker lines. So what are these lines, Mr. Brack? Where do I find these lines? These lines are either in the outlines, in the way that the ground get, um, so if you have like a foot in the ground, what happens is you don't really see the outline of that foot like this very well if you're in the distance. So uh, let me get right. So if your if your leg is in the distance and it's in the ground, if you have a pole in the ground, what happens is that pole gets becomes a straight line at the bottom instead of seeing the actual curvature. If it was really close you see the curvature, just like we're seeing the curvature of this rock. We're seeing the actual curved nature of the rock inside the, 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 the ground. But in the distance, all we see are just literally straight lines, because we don't have enough of a, of a perspective looking down on the object on the ground to see its curvature. In the distance, it just gets flattened and compressed, which is the key word here. So if you place anything on the horizon that's supposed to be on, an, on a flat horizon, it is supposed to have that compression to it. So please do not forget that. That was the one big thing that f came out at me. Um, what, if you don't fix this, the effect that will happen is that if there was someone here and they had a marble, the marble would just roll down, just go down. And you're always going to have, you're always going to have that tilted surface, really bad tiling job happening in all everything. It feels like everything is cascading downward. So you don't want to do that. What you want to do is the opposite. You want to create the feeling of compression, of a flat surface on which these designs are sitting. And there goes the phone. Shut up. So again, you're probably going to have to bring in more designs because this is not enough. This, this amount of design is only good for this, this much into the horizon. What we're going to have to do is bring in some more info. Darken the foreground. And then continue these on straight lines. We have to continue them on straight lines. So what will happen is we have to think about a vanishing point that's, that's causing all of these. So where is this vanishing point? And this is exactly how we continue them. Um, if there is another, I'll probably go this way. I'm not really sure how you're going to, how you design these, but I'm just going to try to do it. So do you see now it actually looks like a surface you can sit on. Oopsie. Dodge tool highlights. Damn it. Duplicate. I'm just trying to create the same effect. And then um, I think over here it would look a little different. It would be more. So then you're gonna ha you're gonna have to ask yourself where is this horizon line, and how is it sitting? It's much easier to to, to paint the, the 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 design on a flat, 2D surface. Just get the design going, blah, 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 and then bring in the um, bring in the uh, the changes just like just like that. If you work digitally, again, work smart, not hard. I mean, work hard, but let's work smart. Don't waste your time. <clears throat> and then for the distance, uh, good job with the reflection on the pillars, but I think you're going to have to bring in a different color for the background. So if you're going to have that red of the lava off in the distance, it's pink, what's the point? 
the, the, the what's lighting up, what's making the background pink. So what you're going to have to do is create a clash of color where the background has a blue tint to it. And it's not really blue, it's just compared to the red, it's blue. So we're going to have that little clash. It's a bit too blue. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring down that value. Merge down. Not the whole pillar is going to be dark, just some of it. I mean lit up, just some. The light is coming from below. Okay, and then we're going to have the light of the background coming in. Just like this unifying. Again, we're bringing the color of the sky onto a unit that exists onto this plane, exists in this plane, to unify it with the background. And the pillars also need to be, have some atmospheric, I mean, some, um, what's it called, some perspective applied to them. So which parts are in the distance, which parts aren't, I can't really mess with it this way. But you're probably going to want to rethink the whole pillars, all the pillars, and see if you really need them. Maybe bring in a more intriguing design. Really just, uh, at the end of the day, sometimes it's not even about skill. Sometimes it's just about design or being an architecture, an architect, um, and uh, thinking about the architectural uh, units. So just making it an interesting object versus a non-interesting object, uh, bringing in more detail. Sometimes it's not even about how you render. It's not about the colors you chose. It's just about what it is that you drew topic. Okay, and then the background is too light, of course. The point of interest is in the foreground, so again, just like I told you, you're going to have to darken up the background just a smidgen. I don't even know if I used that word right. And then choose the light point and have the water reflect that light point. There's water. It's just going to reflect in that straight line. And of course, heat like uh, lets off a lot of, first of all, there's the glare of the fire. There's the actual glow of the fire that needs to be put in there. What that's going to do is change the color. Any colors that are in the background that are in this area here, are going to get changed because the heat is between us and the background, so the heat acts like an atmospheric fade. And then there's the blur. So I'm going to get smudge tool on the brush that is similar to this. And I'm going to get the objects in the distance, and I'm just going to bring in a smudge that makes it seem like they're heated up, because if you've ever looked at asphalt in the summer in the distance, you'll see that it blurs anything. It has like a blur to it. I painted this stupid golem photo once and I have a good example of that in there, but I do not want to show it. And have points where the lava is like coming out. So you get like really hot spots. And around those hot spots we'll have the, the, the blur. And then, of course, the glare. Okay, so this design here, of course, isn't perfect. I mean, you're going to have to redo the design. Um, I'm not really sure how to do it, <laughs> what you wanted. Yeah, this would be a much bigger compression over here. Probably want to bring in some... Aztec type of squares. So it actually looks like, you know, some sort of loading screen. And um, uh, reorganize some of the anatomy that you have. If you're going to have something that is supposed to be anat anatomically accurate, it's supposed to be a skull, pre please, please find a reference and make sure that you're doing it accurately. Make sure that you are thinking about it as a 3D structure. So parts of the skull that will be visible 
because the light is shining on the inside. The skull and the back of the skull um, that's going to be lit up. Um, the highlights over here. The light of the background will not really get to it because there's too much of a light source happening with the lava. It's, it's become the, the primary light source. So you're going to want to um, reorganize that. Okay? So there's all of that. I hope that helped. I'll show you the before and after. So before, after. It was a bit too pink. Um, and you didn't really, it looked like the ground was moving down. So you need to flatten the ground and, and, and put in that compression I talked about, where you have objects in the distance compressing. I applied that. The background, you might want to make it a more realistic blue hue to represent nighttime or dusk or dawn or, or whatever time it is, or the fog, general fog, and like marshes or something like that. And um, some minor light changes. For instance, some yellow would be on the pillar. Some lighting changes, sorry. Over here and over here. Um, look up a good reference for the skull. Look up a good reference for the rocks. It, you can tell when you don't have a visual library that supports this unit. You can tell you don't have a good rock visual library or a good skull visual library. You haven't painted enough skulls or rocks that when you do have to paint them, they look really, really unrendered and really, really blurry because that's as much as your brain remembers. If you had more info, you would be having sharper looking rocks. And where to get more info? Where do I get more info? Well, of course you get more info from the real world. Get a reference going. It's going to make you forget, forget all of the, you know, it's going to make you avoid, I'm sorry, avoid all of the unnecessary unrendered looking something. I mean, this could be rocks, it could be molten lava that's stiffened up. I don't know. You're going to have to find a good reference for it that really um, helps bring out its shape and identify what it is exactly. Okay, so I hope those helped. Um, then we have this object here. So is everybody okay? Does anyone have any question? questions? Um, do some foreground to get some overlap and sense of depth. Um, yeah, definitely, that's a, that's a good idea. Does anybody have any um, any questions? So maybe some molten rocks or something, or stalactites or stalagmites or whatever the heck they're called. <coughs> Something like that, I guess, or some more pillars. Should be thicker, of course, because the background is in the distance. Something like that. Maybe you've got like a sorcerer or something. I'm not really sure. So that's what that was Storyteller's suggestion. So, any questions? Feels like the horizon line is really close to the edge of the plane. Uh, what do you mean? So was Jacob with us today? No, he wasn't. <coughs> so let me get the uh, this one right here. Not sure if I have enough time for anything else. <coughs> the plane with the lava channels. It feels like it should be one straight line. You mean on one surface? Horizon is where your eyes start observing under instead of over. Well, this this seems like it's a it's like a mountain climb. So you're gonna have to climb to get to this point, and then there's like a, a climb down, and then you can go into the background. So it feels like there's like a an edge right here. You have to climb up, and that's the temple sort of. I'm not really sure what you mean. Okay, so I'm going to jump onto this now. And uh, this piece, what, what's happening is she's very long. It's a length, long face, like a length wide, length challenged, no, width challenged. Meaning that you've got the face, like I can literally just do this and it'll fix. 
because there's just it's just that straight a problem. Um, the reason why that could have happened is because of the hair. You were going for that straight hair, and uh, that straight you know bangs straight down. And that, like I said before, in one of my critiques, do not let the hair mess up, mess around, and mess up with your proportions. It, it, it really will. It will do it, and it's not afraid to either. <laughs> Um, it will mess up everything because it's it's acting as an interrupt as an interruption. It's acting as something in, that is in between you and the proportion, and you're going to be thinking about the hair instead of thinking about the appropriate kind of of of, of length, the appropriate symmetry, vertical or horizontal. So literally just doing this, I'm not going to go in and show you how to paint realistic eyes. That'll take up too much time, and it's not really the style you're going for. All I'm going to do. Let's just show you basic shape and symmetry issues that are still present even if you're painting an anime type style face. Which this is, sort of. It's like a realistic anime. It's a very symbolic eye. Good job on the eyeballs. They're very cute. They read very well. So before, after. Man. Before. This is the true before after before after okay and then there is the slight issue of shadows so um you might want to just throw in some cast shadows over here over here <clears throat> so remember whoever painted this this is a study this isn't a masterpiece and if it's going to be a study, and you're going to think about it as a study, might as well just go full, full, you know, study and and get in some some real experimentation with poses. Start experimenting with the pose. That will really help you um, create a more interesting looking composition instead of just having her stand there. I need to practice what I preach, and I need to do that as well. <laughs> but uh, good job. The nose is a bit, you're going to have a bit of trouble with the nose. There are a lot of videos available on noses. Another thing that can make the eyes look realistic that you have completely ignored is the shadow of the upper eyelid on the rest of this. See how useful that is? It really brings the eye to life. Like, holy crap. We can also get some of the pink. See, I said I wouldn't try to make it look realistic, but I just love eyes too much. I'm going to get the pink of the hair and of the lips and of the eyebrows. I'm going to put it in to the waterline. You already have a little bit of pink there, so you should have carried it all the way. That area is pink, by the way. And then a little bit of work on the eyelashes, on the eyelids, I mean. The eyelids will have some light on them. Only on the sides that are facing the light, though. So don't go, don't go crazy. And some, I'm gonna get that pink of the hair, the dark pink, and put it under the lower eyelid to paint the lower eyelid. So remember what I always say: the lower eyelid is not a myth, 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 mythical creature. <laughs> it's a real thing. It happens. The lower eyelid does exist, and it is there in your eye. Even though you don't blink it as much as you blink the upper eyelid, it still blinks, and it still functions. And if you lost your lower eyelid, trust me, you would notice. I'm going to bring in a skin tone that's a bit more yellow, peachy, less peachy, and bring it on the high points to make the skin look a little bit more realistic. Okay, so tiny little changes... Not much, really, but um, before, after, tiny little things. So um, about where you are currently in art, just as you know, from like my point of view and how you should be studying, study faces for now. Let's try to perfect your face. Go grayscale from now on. Get rid of the hair. Focus on hair in a separate study period. I mean, there's nothing wrong with trying to paint a perfect image, but do not try to make a masterpiece this early. Meaning, don't try to paint a finished image. Your gallery should be filled with beautiful studies instead of you trying to do masterpieces when it's just too early to try them. All right. Okay, so. Flatten. Yeah, 
Yes. <clears throat> this must have been a big file. Ugh. Everybody seeing this? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't have any artwork. Her head is changing on the right, isn't it? Sorry, different Jacob. Work on lovely thumbnails. Uh, what about when you're in? They're dirty, gasp, I can assure you they're not. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're all good. <clears throat> Alright, so this character right here, um, he's in a dark room. The issue with this is the light source pin, you, the pin light you've got here, the, the edge light, is really in the way. Uh, you really don't need it. Get it out of there. Because what you're telling me is you're just outlining with a white light. You're not telling me there's any significant secondary light source source around the character. So what's happening is you're you're literally trying to imitate a secondary light source without any of the actual rules that make a secondary light source happen. What you are trying to do though, accidentally, is trying to make the light seem like it's coming from below. So just from here. Like that. That's where it would work. So you're going to have to have the glare of the light source as well as so see where it was before? It was just so random and it was just like an outline from either side. It wasn't really helping to re reveal the form because where do we put secondary light sources, boys and girls? We put secondary light sources in, in the core shadow to diffuse the core shadow. If the core shadow is what we're looking at right here, if this is all core shadow and he's all dark and it's a dark room, then that's where we're going to be putting the core shadow. I mean the secondary light source, god damn. Alright, so where would we put it? We would put some secondary light source on his boobies, on his muscles, on the lower part of his lips, lower part of his chin. So basically flashlight under... So all the, all the core shadows you see here, all of these core shadows under the nose, the forehead, sides of the cheekbone, all of these areas are getting some secondary light source. The bottom of his muscles, the bottom of his arms, the armpits, okay, and I'm literally just going to do that. Right, that's where they need to be, these solid little areas. And then lower Filter, blur, Gaussian blur. So I don't have to spend time waiting and blending. Alright, that seems like a perfect intensity, and now I'm just going to shape them appropriately around the form. Wait a minute. The face needs to be a bit more intense. So I'll merge it down in a second. God damn it, when did I up the opacity? Okay. So the eyebrows, only in that shadowed area was where we got that light. Nowhere else. So the eyebrows become lit up because the light is coming from below. And then we've got the sides of the cheeks. And so basically all we're, we're doing is replacing the shadows with the secondary light source. That's all we're doing. Just technical, scientific rules. makes a little bit more sense 
And now what you can have is the clash. So you're going to have to think about where the primary light source is and where the main shadows are. So now you have to bring in the black and throw in that clash color, which is the outline. So above the eyebrows, just like this. where we are outlining more form on the teeth, shadow on the teeth. Sorry I'm using my soft brush, it's really just challenging all the detail. Um, if you want him to have nipples, I recommend it. Nipples are great. I want to throw in a nipple or two for anatomy's sake. Then there's the space in between the pecs. It'll get some light on it and then in creating that space then we can throw the cast shadow of the pectorals onto the shoulder that the shoulders are picking up. So now we're getting that clash as you can see. The shadow line between primary light source core shadow and secondary light source glare or diffuse. So this whole area back here should be shadowed all the way back there. I'm just going to have to clean up. Okay, so now the light source becomes a little bit more focused in this area behind him should be very dark because it's facing away from the secondary light source and at that point what happens because the room is that dark is you can bring in another light source to defuse it. Let's burn on shadows. Dang it. like this. Just back here. And then what you can do now is bring in another light source. So it could be the actual light source that is, change, is, is, is illuminating the whole room. So at this point you can bring in that, that light that you were trying earlier. And what that will do is bring him out from the dark behind him. It will help reveal some form. Nope. Okay. Just like that, because now we're responding to a main light source. But that's your choice, of course. Before, the, where you had the light source was very, uh, very flat. Okay. So now we have more form that's actually emerging. You can change it to a different color, you can have it, you can bring in that pin light you had and again replace it somewhere else. Let me just try to place it just somewhere small, so it's not in the way. Just to reveal his muscles a little bit more, because this is where it gets darkest, so I want to place in some light in that area. around the edge of his skin. Before, after. Okay, so I hope that helped. Um, again, it depends on how you want to, if it's just flat lines colored in, like for a comic strip, you don't have to do it this way. If you want to get rid of the lines, you're going to have to do it this way because this is the only way you're going to be able to express the form in the edge. When you have lines, you have an edge, and that's what makes life easier. Um, when you have the edge there um, telling you where the edge of the form is instead of having to contour the form and paint it and structure it in. Um, so that's a lot of stuff we learned today. We learned a little bit about compression, a little bit about landscapes, a little bit about depth and atmospheric fade. I hope you guys are taking notes. It's just, just a list. If you have that list, you write it down, you copy it, you won't forget these units. It's the list. When I was young and I was just growing up, I was like, I wish I had a list to follow 
of things that I have to include in my paintings that I have, never have to forget, that I can never forget, and I won't because I'll have that list. This is the actual list. I'm just giving you lists. I write them down on the, on the canvas for a reason. So take them down, guys. So class is done. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, if you guys would like for me to critique your work, it, it is every Tuesday and Thursday um, from 4 to 6 or 4 to 5 or... Six or five to six, it depends on the availability um, on my schedule. So here is the Facebook channel, please. Um, today was four to five. I'm sorry. She likes to change time from five to four. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my eyes. <laughs> hey, Niall, what's up? Yo, Niall's here. Yeah, class is over. I'm sorry. Uh, today was an hour early. I sent out a message. If you guys want to be part of the email group the group that I email as well, please message me on Facebook. Again, this is the Facebook. Message me on Facebook with your emails. I will BCC and I will send you guys the email that's telling you that I will be streaming soon. It will give you the exact time. You can even reply to me on the email giving me your work to critique. So please, go here, go to the Facebook group, like it if you want to. <laughs> plug, plug, plug. And, um, and Message me there with a private message with your email or any work you want me to critique. If you want your original work back that I looked at today and you want the critiqued version, please, again, message me on Facebook and I will give it back to you. Here are some other links. I also uh, send my, I also announce my hours on DeviantArt. I announce my hours on Twitter. I do not announce on Instagram, but you can find my cat on Instagram. She's super cool. And I have Google Community. And I also announce and take critique images on the Google Community. Okay? It's been ignored for some reason. I have it open for you guys if you want to use it. It's a great place to get to get stay connected to me. And to each other, of course. Um, so there's all of those links. <laughs> Please go on those. If anyone is interested in private tutoring, there are some slots open for April, I mean for June and for the end of May. If anyone is interested in private tutoring, I do offer private tutoring. Of course it is paid, but things like 14-day um, challenge, um, you know, the mentorship, private mentorship, um, all of the, you know, a really, really focused class stuff is available um, for, the, for you as well, but it is paid. Um, it is not free, unfortunately. So there's that, and there is the actual class website. 14-day um, challenge, Examples are over here. You guys can find Niles' work on the 14-day challenge page on the Wix website. Niall is among us. He's one He's one of the people who successfully finished the 14-day challenge. I'm very proud of him. So yes, welcome um, everyone who is new. For all those new faces, welcome. Again, it's 4 to 6 or 4 to 5 or 5, just around that time, Eastern time. And thank you everyone for coming. Uh, have a great day and bye-bye.